and welcome back to another episode of Collider Jedi Council. I am Darth Harloff, Christian Harloff, that is, and I have a full council today, and it is a full council full of great guests. First, she is the Smith Lord. She is the host of DC All Access and Fandango. Hello, Tiffany Smith. Hello. I have on my Vader tank today. I'm ready to talk Star Wars. And I'm like trying to focus, but all I want to do is figure out what toys, toys I'm buying to buy toys. And we'll <laughs> for be, Fourth Friday. We'll definitely be about talking about <laughs> toys, but joining us is first time on the council. It is the Grand, Mo Grand Moff Griffin. I almost got it out there. David Griffin, what's up, man? What's up? Thanks for being Glad to be here. Christian, thank you for this new name. I'm going to do my best Mark Ellis impersonation. I'm going to be quick. I'm going to be witty. I'm going to have some great jokes, and I will talk loudly. I thought there you were going to try to be like Mark Ellis. Oh. Was that bad? That's not him at That's all. Not oh, that was all bad. <laughs> that was bad. Well, he's wearing a baseball cap, <laughs> so... You didn't, you didn't describe Mark at all. Well, One step in the right direction. Joining in the grand wisdom of telling you what you're doing wrong, it is Obi-John Kenobi, John Campia. Hello, John. I'm still basking in the glorious look on your face earlier today you on Movie me. Talk when I told you that we just had breaking news that Brian... or. Uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan Johnson. Johnson had yeah. st left episode eight. Yeah, you should have seen this. He told me he's in the middle. In the middle of, of the show. In the yeah. middle Wait, of the show. It was a joke, right? It was a joke. Oh, oh, oh. you could have got it. You could have got it. You Ooh. dropped it. You dropped, like, it. Oh, you dropped it. I was like, that's I what I I, I, that. I I lost my mind when he told me that. So uh, if you want to see that, <laughs> make sure you go and check out Collider movie talk from this morning. Um, all right, let's get into this. So the way this works, guys, if you're brand new, I don't know where I'm looking. There I am. Uh, if you guys are brand new to the show, <laughs> like Christian seems to be right. Now. I am. I'm brand new to the show. I've never done the show before. Read a new set. So we talk about the Star Wars movie news. That is everything that is happening in the world of Star Wars movie news. This could be episode seven, eight, nine, the anthology or Star Wars stories, whatever the hell they're called right now. We talk about that in this segment and the Grand Moff is going to break it down. What do we have first, David? We have first, we are talking about Benicio Del Toro is in Spain promoting his new film, A Perfect Day, and he gets interviewed and he is asked about what he's doing next. And he kind of pauses a little bit, and this is all in Spanish, of course, translated, and responds that, you know, he has Star Wars up next, and he asks him, well, what role are you going to be playing? And he responds with, sorry, my Spanish is a little bit off, but es como el villano, which basically means he's going to be like the villain. Like the villain, not mm. the villain, like the villain. So we don't know what that means. He kind of paused and laughed. And the interviewer was like, oh, wow, you just told me that. Because I don't think a lot of the actors have been coming out and telling people that. So I want to know, what do you think about Benito Del Toro's comments, Christian? About being in episode eight. Well, I mean, there's been rumors for a while here that he was going to be in it, and then he pretty much confirmed it recently that he was going to be in it. But now saying that he films in March is pretty great. I love that Benicio Del Toro is in this movie. I'm curious to what he's going to be playing. I think that it actually lines up that he said sort of the villain from what J.J. has been saying, what Adam Driver said on stage is that no one at stage at Comic-Con is that no one here is pre considers themselves black or white with just evil or good. They all are fighting for a cause that they maybe think is the right mm -hmm. thing. Um, and so by him not giving away, that could mean he's the antagonist in this particular movie in episode eight. Star Wars has done that significantly, bringing in new villains per episode. I think this is another case of that. I'm still kind of crossing my fingers and hoping that he plays an uh, Admiral Thrawn type. But yeah. Tiffany, you hear these comments. What do you think? I think that it's one of those things, like as you're saying, there's so many actors that keep coming out that we assume are going to be villains. Like even with Mads Mikkelsen, where he's like, I'm not playing a villain, but none of these actors are going to go into a villainous role and say like, I'm playing the villain, twiddle my mustache. You know, like you said, all actors who play the evil side are coming in thinking like, I'm the hero. What I'm doing is for the right reasons. And so I think it's that gray area that plays so well, though we say the light and the dark side, that it's that gray where everyone kind of plays in Star Wars. So I love Benicio being a part of this. I think he would be a great addition. And I like the fact that, you know, they're constantly bringing in people who possibly have accents or, you know, can just broaden the world even more. John? I mean, you kind of mentioned the rumors were around that he was going to be in it. Then he kind of just said the other day, yeah, I, it, I am most likely going to be in this movie. And then now this whole thing, I'm sort of the bad guy. I don't actually take it as ambiguous as you guys do. I, when, when he says, yeah, I'm sort of the bad guy, I kind of think he's the bad guy. I think that's the way it's going to pan out. I hope that Star Wars doesn't go too far into like in a lot of movies i like shades of gray not to be confused with 50 shades of gray <laughs> i do like shades of gray in the morals and ethics of characters that gives them a richness that gives them a death a depth but there's something about star wars 
in that classic good versus evil kind of mentality that even at the end when you realize that Anakin was a fallen hero and he kind of gets redeemed, even within those themes, there was always a sense of the light versus the dark, right. you know? And so I hope they don't stray too far away from oh, that. Oh, I don't think they will. I think that what it, what it means from everything that they're saying is there's going to be a clear who we know is good and yeah. who we know is bad. Right. It's just a matter of how they perceive Oh sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I I agree though. I don't I don't want to see like well, that guy's kind of good, but he's really, but he's just got a kind of dark side to him. Stone Cold Steve Austin. It's like no, I don't want that. I I want I want because Snoke is going to be a bad guy. He even is that voice, you know, he's going to be bad. The but da David, you hear Del Toro talk about this. What do you think? I think uh, I kind of agree with both sides here. I think you know, John. I know you said recently you've been watching Hannibal. Do you want to rewatch on Amazon Prime? Uh, Mads Milkinson is perfect in that role because he he kind of you don't know if he, when you first meet him like wait who is this guy even though you know he's Hannibal he's cast as Hannibal he has that allure you know you're drawn oh, to yeah. him I think Benicio when he's at his best has that has that mm -hmm. we saw the trailer for Sicario yeah he you, you can't tell from the trailer is he a good guy or a bad guy you know Sicario means hitman but mm -hmm. is he what side is he on what side is he playing does he does he even have a side and I think that's why when he says I'm like a villain who knows what side Benicio is going to be on we well, even look at characters like Han Solo or Lando where it's like they kind of walk that line, you know, so it's there are a lot of gray, but it's also the Empire magazines come out and you're like, clearly we've got the one side that looks like the villain cover and then right. we've got the heroes cover. Right. And even in the toys, they're saying like hero set. Right. So, right. OK. Uh, all right. What's next? Next topic. We are talking about money, box office potential here. We're talking Star Wars opening weekend. <laughs> Projections are going as high as six hundred and fifteen million dollars. Jurassic World astounded us all this year with its over what, $524.4 million opening weekend. Of course, that is domestic and international combined. Can Star Wars beat that with a potential $615 million? Christian, do you think it's going to make that much money? That's huge. <sighs> it's so, I mean, it's so tough because I have been pretty, I still think the big thing in this article was that they, the, whether or not it can catch Avatar, I do think that there's a chance that it could catch Avatar, mm -hmm. especially if it's a little better than good. If the movie is a little better than good, <laughs> yeah. then this movie could catch Avatar because of the time where it's coming out in December to where it's going to own December. It's going to own January. It's going to own February for the most part. And then March, it'll probably start to tail off once you have Batman versus Superman come out. And then you'll see the trail off is what I think as far as overall. That's why I think it has a shot. Now, as far as opening weekend goes, the same reason I thought that it has a shot to go overall is because in that opening weekend, nothing, Hobbit or whatever, one of the Hobbit movies, 86 million, largest opening ever in December. It's definitely going to beat that. It will approach 150. I think it can even get to 200. But because of the cold weather and everything else, I think that it's going to be tough to crack 200 mil. But you keep reading these numbers and these experts thinking how big, they're projecting 300 million opening weekend here, people think. I think that's insane. But John, what do you think? It's not possible. Not possible, it's right? It's absolutely not possible. I mean, first of all, that $300 million mark, right? It's just, I don't know that it's physically possible that you can do that. Forget theoretically. Is it physically possible? Are there enough screens with enough seats that can fill that, that for people, if, even if everybody in the country wanted to go to see it opening weekend, are there enough screens with enough seats that could facilitate a $300 million opening weekend? I, it's, it's, you'd basically have to shut down every other film. And just like, I remember when Avengers opened on its opening weekend at the AMC Burbank 16, it was opening in six of the theaters, but pretty soon they sold out and it went to seven, then it went mm -hmm. to eight and went to nine. By two o'clock in the morning, it was all 16 theaters. Mm. You would pretty much have to do that in every single theater across the country. I just don't think it's going to happen. And you mentioned the Hobbit numbers with 84 million. There's a reason the Hobbit only made 84 million open because movies prior to that, I think the biggest opening weekend in December history was like 76 million dollars. There's a reason. It's, it's it's the cold weather is certainly a part of it, but there are several factors. It's the holiday season. People are spending time with family. It's Christmas. People are spending all of their money. It's a very tall order. I'm more with you. I think that 150 million, I mean, it's going to obliterate the existing record, yeah. no doubt. I think 150 million domestic is a more realistic goal to achieve. I think if it gets 150 million, because there are going to be people out there, if this movie hits 150 million opening weekend, there are going to be a bunch of idiots out there who go, what went wrong? I was just going to ask you that, yeah. What, yeah. Why did it fail? <laughs> if it doubles the existing record, yeah. that will be a huge success. Now, as far as worldwide numbers go, the reason why on Movie Talk and stuff like that, we never discuss 
worldwide numbers opening weekend is because every movie opens in different countries at different times. Some movies open in 50 countries on one weekend. Some movies open in 10 countries one weekend. So it's impossible to judge apples to oranges that way. So I don't really know what their international release plan is at this point. I'm sure we could look it up. 600 million in December, though, seems like a really tall order. I... I Ah, oh, man, I don't know. I'm just going to stay with domestic. I say $150 million should be the target. David? I'm looking at more, uh, my question would be long, longevity. Like when Avatar came out, it didn't even break $80 million domestically. No, it did not. But it dropped. Yeah. You know, because you know how these box office, like 50 Shades of Grey comes out, it drops 70% mm -hmm. and it's, and it's you know, the next weekend. But Avatar, I think, just dropped from like $77 million to $70 million. It dropped it, like $1.2 right. yeah. right. yeah. million. It, 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 it just right. kept right. staying. And now it's, right. and if you look at Jurassic Park now, it's still a billion dollars behind on the box office of Avatar. Still a billion, still billion, billion behind. Avatar, I think it's like at yeah. 1.6 billion. Like, eh, it's not that much. No, but I want to know if Star Wars can have that longevity. I think it could. I think it could potentially get up to Avatar, even if it doesn't have a $600 million. But award. opening weekend is going to be tough to do this. I don't think big, it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's one of those things where you look at a movie like Avatar, and I'm not going back to see that a bunch of times. It looks cool. I wanted to see the 3D, but this movie is going to be like, I watched the trailer at least 10 times when I first saw it, the teasers, just to kind of pick everything apart. So I feel like the reason this movie has real potential for breaking a lot of records is because I'm someone who's probably going to go see it and be like, I'm just going to go right back in and see it again. And that's someone who's like, obviously, we're massive fans, but I think that that's going to happen across the board with a lot of people going to see this. And that's what's going to drive the numbers up even more. And I do think that is going to happen, John, where it's like theaters, they just keep adding and adding and adding and adding because it's like... Family time, yes, but this is a movie that pretty much the entire family could go and see, and it's not that expensive for a holiday thing if you're not seeing it on IMAX because it's a little bit more money on IMAX. So I think it's going to be one of those things where it's like massive families go as an event because it's like the older people have seen the original ones. The kids are like, ah, BB-8, I want to watch it, and Rebels and whatever. So I think that it's across the board, and I, I think it could break 200. Mm. All right. Uh, what's next? Next topic. Instagram is just no longer a place where you go to look at cute kittens doing their thing. Now you can go see <laughs> Star Wars, The Force Awakens trailers right there. We got a nice picture of uh, Finn, John Boyega. That's I mean, that's probably the key shot from the trailer. You also get to see the first order, which we've seen that footage before, but it kind of has that that pan where you can see uh, all the army assembled. But I mean, this is the big reveal here. Seeing the, the blue lightsaber uh, and the same snow forest, snowy forest as uh, Kylo Ren. So what do we think about this uh, 15 second trailer? Well, you know, what's funny about this trailer is that last week we had to do the episode of Jedi Council on Wednesday um, and <laughs> right, this yes. thing came out on Thursday morning after, and we're like, yeah. no, um, but we've watched this a million times since it's come out. And so my, my thoughts on this particular trailer was there's just a couple of new images. It's Daisy Ridley, which I think is probably towards the end of the movie right there. She's still with BB-8. I think those Two are like frickin' frack, so they're together. <laughs> um, but you're right. It's the Boyega holding the lightsaber. We've kind of known that it was a, he was going to be holding the sword. I mean, even that Drew Struzan picture at D23, he had the, the lightsaber. Um, so what it said to me, though, was there's a trailer coming soon. That's what it said to me, because otherwise, why would we release this new image just randomly on a Thursday? So I, the question I think that what I'd like to hear from you guys as we talk about your thoughts on this trailer is when do you think that we're going to get the trailer? Because initially I thought it would be Force Friday. I thought we were going to get it, but it, they're spending so much time on the toys and, and they had that whole thing yesterday. I wouldn't be surprised if we get it sometime next week, but that's me. Tiffany, where do you think? Um, two things. This to me is what a teaser trailer should be <laughs> <laughs> because I look at the teaser trailers that we've gotten and I'm like, those are trailers aside from the fact that we're not getting story points. Um, I felt like this was something that teased me. I got super excited and we actually got to see Finn with the lightsaber moving, using it. And the other part of it for me is you think about movies and how many times a trailer has footage in it that doesn't actually end up in the film. So for me, I'm almost hoping that they're using stuff that was great, that they're like, these shots look awesome, but we don't need them in the mm -hmm. movie. That it's like, let's burn them on Instagram. Let's burn them in like these little teaser trailers. So that way people are still excited, but you don't feel like that same kind of feeling that I got from Man of Steel, where it was like, all the great stuff was right there. And then I saw the movie and I was like, I want more of that. And it wasn't But there. Man of Steel had like eight trailers at this point. Well, yeah, yeah but that, I mean, this is where I thought that we were going to get a trailer on Force Friday as well. Then I started to think about, well, what movies are opening up this weekend? Really, we only have Transporter Refueled. And I'm like, I 
don't think they would put it at the top Best of that. Best movie ever. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then it's also, if there's a trailer now and we still have till December, I don't, I don't need to full trailers between now and December. So I would almost rather them hold off a little bit and maybe even give us one more of these little teasers with some of the original actors. That would freak me out and I'd be yeah. super excited. I don't really need much story. One trailer, I'm good. David. I love these teasers. I think they're wonderful. I, I, I always go back to the Amazing Spider-Man too. When they show that trailer, especially with the last scene with uh, uh, you know Peter Parker winding the um, sewer crate and getting ready to you know throw it uh, over there at um, uh, Rhino. Like the, it showed the whole movie in, in that trailer. I was just so disappointed. I went to go see it. Like you said with Man of Steel, there's yeah. nothing left. There's just nothing more. So I love these little teasers. I wish they do more of them. I'm happy with the Instagram 15 seconds. When do you think we're getting a new trailer? I, I, I'll be doing it tomorrow. I want to see Force Friday. Trailer. You think it's gonna happen? There's actually a Twitter question later on in our, uh, the show. We're gonna oh, talk okay, about that. But about yeah, okay. I, I, I really think it might be tomorrow. John. Well, first of all, you were pretty <laughs> stupid to think that a, a trailer was gonna drop on Force Friday. However, wow. some bigger idiot yeah. oh, no. predicted it was gonna come out last Friday. All right. And that <laughs> was this big. <laughs> right here. Yeah, my my rationale, which way I to be was, humble, John, which yeah. I thought was so so sound. My logic at the time was. You know, usually what happens with studios do is they drop the first poster for a movie, and then within 24 hours, they launch their first their, their next trailer. Or the trailer comes out, like, mm -hmm. within a day. So they release this 15-second thing, and I remember thinking, okay, follow the logic. They're releasing this little teaser. It's given us almost next to nothing, but it feels like a warm-up warm -up act, you know? It feels like Lenny Kravitz before you, too. It feels like tomorrow... We are getting this. And the next day was Friday. And I never thought they were going to release a trailer on Force Friday because I thought they want to keep all the focus on the toys. At least that was my logic at the time. I thought, it's coming out tomorrow. I mean, I had nothing to base that on. But I mean, it's coming out tomorrow. You watch. Smartest guy in the world. Yeah, not so much. Uh, <laughs> it did not come out. But here's the thing about the trailer. Honestly, as I try to be more objective about it, there's nothing special about that 15-second trailer. But you, me, Ellis... We're giggling like a bunch of right. freaking idiots, okay. like with jumping up and down, whatever. And I'll, I'll never forget, Ashley Mova was in the room with us. And Ashley Mova goes, okay, I, I, what, what is this amazing thing that you guys are like losing your minds over? And she walked around and watched on a marked phone. She was just like, you guys are such losers. I mean, right. that, that was basically no. she, no. she, no. she, 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 she didn't say that out loud. She, she just didn't, didn't, she didn't understand. She, she looked, yeah. she just goes, what's the big yeah. deal? We, yeah. First of all, you've seen everything in here except for that shot of Boyega. Yeah. Um, but it's because she didn't understand. Yeah, right. but he's... He's holding, he's holding a, a lightsaber. Light yeah. And that's right. Luke's lightsaber. And, it, and that's exactly, Vader's lightsaber. Like, yeah, yeah, Luke. yeah. That, that's what it is. Well, and it's also, you know, I think about, and this is so not like apples to oranges, but I'm like, when we shoot a show and they're like, you can't post a picture of who you interviewed until like we get closer to the show airing. It's like two weeks that I have to wait. And I think about John getting ready for this coming out and he's like, oh my God, they're going to post it and yeah. I can post it and everyone's going to see me with lightsaber. It's going to be the coolest thing right. ever. So I feel like I get excited thinking of it from their perspective as well and just the giddiness and glee that they must have. And, you know, it was like when I talked to JJ at D23, I was like, do you feel like you can kind of breathe a sigh of relief as more and more comes out to the fans? And he was like, yeah, it's nice because now you can start talking about it with people. Like, this is really, we saw the picture with him with the lightsaber, but it's like, how much now does he actually it, right, use it, right. you know? And so now yeah. it's like, you know he's going to fight with it. Yeah. Yeah. But, but something Christian and I were talking about before, too, and I, and I still really stand by this. Going back to the whole, you know, preview for season two of Rebels, when we saw that Kanan was going to fight Vader, and I hadn't seen it yet, and you had just seen it. But I, And I remember saying to Christian, man, this better be a world-class ass-kicking. Like, Kanan cannot stand up to Vader. I get the same feeling when I see this picture. If you're going to have Kylo Ren there and Boyega, who I'm assuming could be totally wrong in this assumption that he is new to the ways of the Force in this movie, this better be a world-class ass-kicking that John Boyega right. is about to get. Uh, I think that's where they're going to go, and then they will build him up from there. Unless he's just like a, a natural and holds his own for a second and then gets his ass kicked. But remember, yeah. think about like the first time Luke fought Vader, right? World-class ass-kicking. He goes away from that, learns, but, grows. But he held his own back. in the beginning. On best, yeah, in, in, yeah, the, in the in the throne room, he he he, he then held Vader his own. Got serious. Then Vader started. <laughs> right, well, that's what I'm saying. So in the beginning, he said, "Oh, yeah. there's potential there." Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, now I'm just going to throw but things at your also, face. Also, like it's Kylo, and you don't know how powerful what, he is. How, where he's right. at right. because right. it's also you know you guys have talked about this, but he's not Sith, so it's like, or they're saying that. And so it's like, where is he on the level of being able to use the force at this point? And it's like you look at Rebels when Ezra first fought 
with Vader too. And it was like, there were moments where he had like a second of, oh, Vader's like, crap, this kid's actually, he can't fight me for a long time, but right. he's got a couple of moves here and there. Right. So I'm like, that could be the same kind of thing that they do. I'm sure. so curious to see what the fight choreography is going to look like. We know that they picked yeah. up the guys from the raid That's to help them. Nuts. with. I mean, if you get the guys like, hey, we want the guys from the raid. We want that in Star Wars. I, think so the guys, I, what, <laughs> I agree with you. And I think the guys from the raid are going to be Knights of Ren. And, and listen, oh, listen seriously, <laughs> like, I, you know me, I, I very rarely say anything positive about the prequels, but I was watching uh, a cut of the Phantom Edit earlier today. I was just I was getting ready for work. And you know what? Like, say all that you will about the prequels, and it deserves all of it. The fight choreography in the vast majority of the stuff in the prequels was pretty impressive. I know a lot of people didn't like the Yoda fights, but I was watching the em the Emperor and Yoda fight again. I'm like, that's actually it, pretty spectacular stuff. It was, as far as it, to me, that my biggest problem with the fight choreography in the prequels was that it looked like a really pretty dance. Like yeah. you can sometimes, almost, yeah, I did. so sometimes like the Darth Maul Obi Wan fight, it's it's a great fight. But if you you almost look to where they're in their heads going, okay, one two three, step one two three, duck. You could see yeah. it like it's almost that. That's what I love about like movies like The Raid. Mm -hmm. The core, like we were just talking about this yeah. transporter to the movie. The the fight car is so bad and it looks so fake. The raid, even though it's so elaborate and crazy, it looks as if it's real. Yeah. It looks like they're thinking that just that's that's how they fight. That's what I want this to look. But I think it's also in something like the raid. You're hiring guys who are fighters. Yeah. They know right. what they're doing, and so the learning curve is a lot shorter. Where it's like that one scene in the raid two is maybe one of the longest running fight scenes I've ever seen. Minus and they live. It, I was about to say, <laughs> except for Roger Piper in that alley. Yeah. Um, so I think that the fact that, you know, we're getting parkour guys in it, we're getting people from the raid, and even the, um, what's the guy's name from Game of Thrones? Uh, oh, right, right, right. I, I always forget the, his name. Oh, Oberon. Sword, no, 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 not no, Oberon. No, the the sword the, fighter. He trained Arya. Oh, um, oh, so I, I think that having about. all of these people that are legitimately already trained in that stuff coming in, we're already starting from a better point than where we were in the prequels. Yeah. Yeah. All right, David, what's next? All right, next we are going to episode eight, casting. This is the short list, revealed, rumored, out, you know, people are talking. We have three lovely ladies, very talented ladies. We have Ryan Johnson. Well, no, it's not Ryan Johnson anymore. If you watch what we talked earlier. Sp <laughs> <laughs> it is Ryan Johnson. Spielberg, Don't confuse the people. Spielberg has stepped in it's and Michael inserted Pat. his might. He's like, I will take over. This is my, no. Um, Ryan Johnson's is episode eight. We have uh, Gina, I'm going to mess up. Yeah, Gina Rodriguez from uh, Jade the Virgin. We also have Tatiana Mislani, very talented, uh, Orphan Black. And we also have Olivia Cook. For me, Earl and the Dying Girl. Uh, I also know from the Bates Motel TV shows in AE. She's right. great in that. Three very talented leads. What do we think? Uh, who do we want in the movie? If we only have one, who do we want? Well, I don't know what the what the role is. I mean, yeah. so if we I go... I don't care. It's Tatiana. Yeah. <laughs> well, if we go with that rumor, that rumor that happened last week, the rumor that Geek Nation had put out there that it looks like this could be Han Solo's daughter, right? If we right. think that this maybe this is Han Solo's daughter... Well, that I assume would take Gina Rodriguez out of the running if that's his daughter. But if the report wasn't Han Solo's daughter, and it's a completely new character and a different character, maybe John Boyega's love interest or or someone else's love interest. Who knows? Um, who would I, I? I like all three of these actresses. I really have become a big fan of Olivia Cook lately. Oh, Me sure, Earl and the yeah. Dying Girl. Yeah. She was incredible in. Um, and I, I, don't, I haven't seen enough of Tatiana Maslany, but I would say that yeah. she is probably in the lead to get this because she was rumored to be to get the role. She was her between brand. her mm -hmm. and um, help me out for uh, the Rogue Run. Who's who's cast? Uh, Felicity. Rogue Run? Felicity, Felicity Jones. Jones. Yeah. Felicity Rogue Jones. One. Rogue One. Rogue One. What? Rogue One. Rogue yeah. One. Felicity <laughs> Jones. Uh, and it was up between the two of them. So I think she's in their sights. She's she. I think she's probably going to be the one. I know Tiffany that you agree with me. Well, here's the thing. I think that. Olivia looks very similar to the two other young lead females that have been cast already. So I think that it would be, unless she's playing a sibling to one of them, then it would be smart to maybe pick somebody else who has a little bit different of a look, not because ethnically diverse, whatever, but just because of the fact that it's like, you don't want to have two actors in the movie that look so similar that you're like, which, who am I following right now? Um, with Gina, I feel like she's doing a film, we just finished a film in New Orleans and she was doing a lot of boxing training. Mm. So prior to seeing, I follow her on Instagram because I really like Jane the Virgin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so if I hadn't seen that kind of stuff with her, I might be a little more hesitant about her because I like Jane the Virgin, but nothing about that show says Star Wars right. to me, unless you're casting her maybe as like, a politician or a princess or someone who's a little bit further on the outskirts or upper echelon kind of thing. Um, and then with Tatiana, you've got to watch Orphan Black, man. 
she plays so many roles. She plays like the sub- mom from suburbia. She plays the edgy girl. She plays everything. And so it's like, yeah, let's talk about what role they're going to give her. But I know she can pull off any role right. that they give her. And I feel like she's primed for it. And if you talk about the actors that they chose from before, where it's like they're kind of well-known, but not really breaking the barrier. She's known, especially at the Comic-Con world, but not across the board. So I think this would be something that would really open it up for her. John? Um, well, I mean, you said the absolute key thing in this is we don't know what the role is. It's it's impossible to say which one of these would be best for a Star Wars. What's the role? Is the role a Wookiee? Right, and then, right. and put, which one's the tallest then? Then you go right. for that one. Right. You know, I, I just don't know. Now, but if you want to take all that out of it and just play, pick your favorite, um, I don't know how you don't go with Gina Rodriguez. This girl is for real. She is so much more than just what you see in Jane the Virgin. I think she's got that Deepwater Horizon coming out with Mark Wahlberg. And I think she's going to shock a lot of people with that movie. I mean, look, she's already Golden Globe winner. She's already been a Critics' Choice, either a nominee or a winner. I can't, can't remember. She transcends like just whatever genre you happen to have her in at the time. I would like, look... There is no wrong answer up there. Yeah. None. You Star Wars wins no matter who they go with or whatever. You did raise a, an interesting point, though, about the, uh, you know, you're talking about if it's Han Solo's daughters, does that take Rodriguez out of the running? Well, then why is Rodriguez in the running? So I, I tend to wonder if it's really that. But the big question for me, and this came up on Movie Talk, when I read the first report, it's the, the report read, and maybe this is a problem with the report, but the report read, the lead female role for Star Wars Episode Eight, going to be doing this week or next week, um, chemistry reads mm-hmm. with John Boyega. Yep. Where the hell's Daisy Ridley going? Like, w- like, wait a minute, wait a second, hold the phone, stop the train for a second. New female lead for Episode Eight, doing chemistry reads with John Boyega. I thought Daisy Ridley was our female lead for this new trilogy. Now, so is it a problem with the report? A problem with the wording of the story and all that kind of stuff? Or is there something else going on? It's like, wait a minute, did this report just tell me that Daisy Ridley dies in episode seven or that she disappears? So it's just, it brought up all these very confusing, troubling questions for me that um, I'm just dying to know what you guys think about that. There's multiple male leads in tons yeah, of no, movies. But, so I don't think saying that it's a female lead is anything to say no, that I another lead saying, is going though, away. But it, no, but I think, but, but the fact that I think the main point here, John, is that what you're saying is as far as that, because they're reading with John Boyega. So why it, it's got to be a big enough role that they're going to be spending the most of their time with Boyega. Yeah. So where does Ridley go? My thought on that, and David, I know I want to hear what you think as mm-hmm. far as these guys go, but uh, these girls go, but I, I think that you're going to see Daisy Ridley is going to be going off on another adventure, very similar to what Luke did. In Empire Strikes mm-hmm. Back, when it takes off to Dago, yeah, because Luke doesn't. Because if you if you did this today and you hear to read against, uh, you know, Mark Hamill, is it, you're like, well, why why is he with Leia and Han? He was supposed to be with Leia and Han in the first yeah. one, so maybe they just go off on their but own the adventure. The report wouldn't say. Um, uh, why am I forgetting Lando's Billy D. Williams? Right. Uh, the, the report wouldn't say uh, Billy D. Williams is coming in to read for the lead role. No, I know, I know, a lead or it, maybe it's so a big problem. Maybe it's just a problem with the way yeah, they're wording so. the story. But David, so you see these three ladies. Mm-hmm. Who do you wish is going to be in Star Wars? Can't say all of them. <laughs> A little bit east. No, uh, yeah. I, I would take Tatiana just because when I first saw Orphan Black, I said, why is this girl not nominated for an Emmy? I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, this year she this is year she nominated. She nominated. Yeah. Finally, this is after season three. Yeah. So she's finally getting an Emmy nod. It depends, like you said, what the role is. I think if you're going to go dark, you want Tatiana and you want Olivia Cook. If you're gonna, if she's going to be a hero, the, the more you know, the heroine. I think then you go for Gina Rodriguez. Not that Gina can't go dark, but I haven't seen her mm-hmm. enough to know if she can go dark or not. So I would go. It's Ryan Johnson. You're going dark. So dark. <laughs> well, if you're going dark, they're either going. I'm going with Tatiana. But if they choose another girl, then I want Olivia Cook. Okay, David. What's next? We are talking about. Sorry, everybody. else here. <laughs> uh, we are going with um, uh, JJ. JJ Abrams. Sorry, JJ Abrams is talking about uh, keeping his fanboy at bay. He says, uh, in, in answer to a question like, you know, are you kind of geeking out? Are you freaking out when you're on set? He said, that was a constant in the production of the movie. Moments where we would all look around and realize what we were doing and gasp a little bit and then dive back in. When you're on set of the Millennium Falcon or staring into the eyes of C-3PO giving directions, it's pretty easy to have the fanatic part of you babble up, bubble up. But our job was to be there to tell a story and to not be a fanboy. Christian, is this a pro just doing his job like LeBron would be doing at the NBA <laughs> Finals, hopefully winning a title? Um, I think y- yes. Uh, <laughs> but but the thing is, this is, again, 
the guy you want to start the universe all over again because mm -hmm. he brings in a guy like Simon Pegg, who's his buddy, who's an Uber fan, but is able to not because the thing is, an Uber fan would start to think, well, I can put this part in there from this part of the extended universe. You can't confuse people. You got to make new fans. You got you to think about a, an audience. And it's his job as a director and a producer to get the mass audience and not just Star Wars fans and to create new Star Wars fans. And to do that is to create a rich universe and bring us back to the place that when we were all kids and fell in love with that these new kids are going to fall in love with and do the same thing. And that's JJ's job. And I think that he's done that so far in just the trailers and the, and the, and the buildup and the way he's done this so far. So it, it's it's nice that he says, I'm, I'm controlling myself, I'm controlling myself. But it also makes me go, that's the guy you want. Mm -hmm. He is a fan. He's going to start us. Because everyone says, no matter who it is, they go, well, Star Wars changed my life. Star Wars was the one. Star Wars was the one. And, and nine out of ten times, they're all being legit. They're all being sincere about this. But this was a guy that he's always talked about. Even when he did Star I'm not a Star Trek guy. He does Star Trek. You know, I'm not Star and it felt like Star Wars when he did Star really Trek. Did. <laughs> so, um, but, John, you hear these comments. What do you think? I think this is the best possible thing we could hear from him because here's what happens. A lot of times what we do as fans, I am guilty of this. I'm going to assume all of us at this table are guilty of this and you are guilty of this. I think one of the things we do as fans is we just geek out too much. Oh, but let's have an Avengers movie and let's bring in the X-Men and let, let's get Marvel, get the Fantastic Four back and bring in Spider-Man and bring in everybody. It's like, okay, yeah, that's great for our joygasm as fans, but that would be a terrible movie and just be a mess. And what I love about these comments is that J.J. one, he embraces his geekdom about Star Wars, but number two, he says, but I'm going to keep it at bay. I'm gonna remember, I need to make the best movie I can. I'm not going to turn into Patton Oswald from Parks and Rec. Right. Well, I'm not gonna start it with Boba Vett coming out of the Sarlacc pit, and then the Avengers come in, and then the X-Men join in, and they fight Darth Vader. No, it's not going to be that, although one of the I greatest, funniest moments, yeah. one of the greatest moments on TV history was that on Parks and Rec. I love that JJ can be self-aware and say, that is a part of me. Well, I'd love to start this off with Boba Vett coming back for Avengers. He's going to keep that part in check while he just harnesses his love of Star Wars to make the best movie he can. I think it's a perfect statement. He also knows that all that other stuff that he wants to have, this isn't one movie. There's tons of movies. Even the movies yeah. that doesn't line up into his, his trilogy, there's tons of movies. So he, as a fan, will be able to see those other stories. But David, you hear these comments. What do you think? Uh, I, I think he can handle it. I mean, it's like, I, I know I use a sports analogy. Maybe that's, I, mean, I don't know if that's a good analogy or not. I think he's, he's a professional. He's been in the game a very long time. He's, the worry is if he's going to let it go to your head. You're in the NBA Finals, you're in the UFC Championship, you're Conor McGregor going for a fight, ready to fight, and all this hype and all this people building you up saying you're the best, you're the number one contender. And what do you do when it's time to work, when it's time to do what needs to be done, get the to-do list done, get step-by-step, -step, go through the procedure? I think J.J. is a pro at that. J.J. may not be the most inventive director. He's not going to be known as an Orson Welles. He's not going to be known as like Quentin Tarantino. He's not going to be maybe the most original guy, but he does what he does well and he's a professional and he gets the job done. Michael Bay does it. I'm not comparing JJ. I'm as much different. You get, you get well, right I'm, out I'm of this sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But, but, but Michael Bay, the reason why he keeps getting hired over and over because he does his job well. You hear he does very, what you, he does right. well. You hear well. very little drama on the set. He gets things done and that's what a professional does and that's what JJ is going to do. He's going to deliver. Yeah. Better than Michael Bay would, right. I think. Right. I just gotta, sorry, I got to put right. that out there. <laughs> um, I think it's, you know, we all get to work in an industry where sometimes we get to talk to our idols. We get to interview people or sit down and chat with them. And it's like we had um, Sean Astin on Schmoes right, a right. long time ago. And I remember it's one of those things where in the moment you do the interview, I asked the like good questions that I'd planned out that I wanted to talk to him about. And then as soon as the cameras go down and he comes over to me to talk about Lord of the Rings, I start geeking out, like right. legitimately start sweating. Like, mm. so I have a Lord of the Rings. Says, you have a, do you have a tattoo? Like <laughs> can't keep right. myself together. But when it was time to work, I was fine. So it's like, I appreciate that side of him too, where it's like, I guarantee you they had nights where they all flipped out and where he's like, there's a moment where you're looking at BB-8, I'm creating a new character for the Star Wars universe and you can go home and like, talk to your wife or talk to your kids or talk to whoever it is, your best friend. And be I like, met with John yeah. Williams today. <laughs> yeah. John Williams. Yeah. Because it's like, there. If, if all of that went out the window, I'd be like, you don't understand what you're working on and you don't understand what impact you're going to have on all of the other fans growing up. So I, I'm pretty sure and I, I think that he'll hopefully talk about it more once these movies come out and people love them, that he'll be like, yeah, these were the moments where we all geeked out. And I think the actors say a little bit more of that now, especially the new ones. Well, I think to perfectly illustrate the point you're raising so perfectly is John Boyega. You guys remember yeah. when he started, Boyega started talking about 
calling his mom yeah. Yeah. to let mm. his mom know that he was going to be in Star Wars. I think this is a perfect yeah. example yeah. of what you're talking about. All right, what's next? So next, we are talking about filming locations, set locations. We're going to the beautiful uh, Ireland here. and talk about specifically the Skellig Michael Island has been confirmed as a filming location for episode eight. Uh, local, uh, call him a minister or politician there, said that basically he said two films, both movies are going to be here, kind of an interview, so we know that they're going to use the shooting place. It's very beautiful. There's some like stone hut-looking structures. You know, it's a, it's a gorgeous location. So, I mean, what do we think about this new well, location? Well, we, we've been talking about this, John, a lot, this, this yeah. location. It's been a, a constant story on Jedi Council for the last uh, couple months, and it's we've been wondering, and I think that myself, you, and Mark have all kind of speculated this would be episode eight. Um, and we also think this this is where Luke's been. I think Luke has been here. I think that they probably from, and, and, and actually, by the way, that shot of Daisy Ridley in a little teaser could been uh, could have been on Skelly Michael Island here. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that's indeed where it is and that's where she finds him and that's where, you know, they have one more location get her and Luke the hell out of there and then they don't have to worry about the politics and, and all the stuff that's been going on there. But I'm glad they locked it down. I think that'll be the case. Um, but David, you know, you, this location's been around for a little bit of them talking about it. Are, are you happy that it's confirmed for episode eight? Yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, look at how it's beautiful that it's just seen. I love when they shoot in other locations. Like, you know, we get to see Game of Thrones shoots in Ireland uh, outside of uh, Belfast. I mean, Scotland, Prometheus, is whatever you think about that movie shot in Iceland, all these foreign these locations that just... Mm -hmm. We so we see so many things here in the states. We watch all our television. Everything's filmed in, you know, Vancouver, L.A., Atlanta, all this stuff. So I love when they shoot. Just for the record, locations. Vancouver is not know, in the I, states. I, know, I, don't I just want to point that out. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, but I just I love seeing these kind of locations. Yeah. I don't know what scene's going to be there, but I'm great. I'm glad they're shooting. Tiff. Well, we've talked about this. Where I I definitely do think that's where Luke has been, and even kind of jumping off of your point earlier, where you were like the lead female, where is Daisy? And I'm like. I think that she's going to end up on this island with Luke being trained. And so it's like, while that's happening, there's another female character that's involved with whatever's right. going on, you know? And so I think that having that location, and we've heard from reports that it's only been the two of them that I think were seen on the island shooting prior to. Right. So that's kind of where I think, and, and the fact of all the pictures where it's like these ancient ruins that are just so beautiful and cool. And you talk about practical effects, but I'm like, I think practical effects even lend themselves to landscapes where it's like, Absolutely. you don't have to mm -hmm. do green screen in the background and then like create the rest of the world. It's like they can shoot on this Island and it's going to look epic from every angle. Right. John. Yeah. It reminds me of Peter Jackson shoot Lord of the Rings. How are we going to create this mm -hmm. battle scene? Uh, just point the camera that way. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think, Look, my natural inclination is to believe that this is where Luke is because, look, when, when Yoda had to get away, where did he go? He went to a place filled with life, surrounded by life, yeah. where forces generate. He's surrounded by the ocean, which is just filled with life. I mean, it's he's on a rock, yes, yeah. but he's surrounded it by It looks ocean. like a Jedi temple almost. It kind of so, yeah. does, well, yeah. right? The ruins that they're actually there does look like old, the the little old Jedi temples. Yeah. 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 yeah, so I'm, I'm completely on board with that. I think it is, and it is a gorgeous... Set because I think if you were to go back, you know, into to eras gone by and talk about where could you have shot this scene in Star Wars? Well, other than Hoth, I'm not really sure. I mean, there's not even a Dagobah anywhere on Earth. You got to make that like on it. a set. But if you can find areas where you can just do what Peter Jackson did, and just like point the camera that way, then that, I think it's going to bring a more sense of a sense of a groundedness, a sense of a reality to it that I think will be new to us. And yeah. I'm really excited about it. You've right. been talking about how important practical effects are in this yeah. movie, so I think. Yeah. Yeah. All right, last story in the Star Wars stack stories today. What's the last one? We are going to now a Bubba Fat. Fan made uh, trailer for a fan made film. It's going to be called Star Wars The New Republic Anthology. The synopsis reads After being trapped for 30 years in the great pit of Carcoon, infamous bounty hunter Bubba Fett makes a death defying escape and finds himself fighting alongside the rebellion to establish a new republic. Incredible looking trailer. Christian, what did you think about this fan made trailer? Now, some people, if you didn't see this trailer, like, why the hell are they talking about a fan made trailer? Uh, why, why? I mean, there's so many of them. There's so many good ones out there. There's so many fan made Star Wars stuff. Mm -hmm. This looks like the movie. This guy is like yeah. auditioning to become the next director to step in where Trank <laughs> left because that's the movie you want. You don't want, like John said a million times, and I agree with him, you don't want him taking off the mask and going, hey, I'm, I'm home from work, honey. Uh, yeah, it was a tough day as a bounty hunter. You want him crawling out of the, uh, of the pit. You want the mask on there, him trying to figure it out, and then summoning the, the slave to, and then, I mean, that's the movie I wanted. That's the Boba Fett movie that if you're going to make, 
I want to watch it. I think that it was shot really well. The the the, the C3PO voiceover in the background was incredible. Tiffany, you saw this fan made trailer. Did you lose your mind like me? I was like, this is this looks like if I didn't read the fan part, I'd be like this is something that they released that this is super early for the anthology or Star Wars story film that's coming out. Um, but I, what I loved about reading that little clip was that he said he'd heard that they wanted to do this movie. And so he went and made the trailer. And I'm like, that's something that is so awesome where it's like fans now know if you can make a good product and you can actually make an awesome clip for a movie or show that you have talent and skill. It's like, people are watching that. People are looking for that. And it was like, when we were at Celebration and they said, you know, they looked at the people who were building the R2-D2s and they brought them into the movie where it's like, it's not far off for someone to say, we see the thing that you made. Let's see a little bit more. Maybe you're like second AD or like yeah. Kathleen second Kennedy unit. pays attention to that stuff for yeah. sure. She pays attention to the fans. John, now I'm so curious because I can see you going either way here. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm going to pick in my head which way you're going. The floor is yours. Yawn. <laughs> I knew it. Pure yawn. <laughs> It, it was it was a guy in a Boba Fett costume. To his costume. default response. I knew it. <laughs> it. It was a guy in a Boba Fett, a very good looking Boba Fett costume. But it was a guy in a Boba Fett costume walking across some sand. That's the trailer. Dun dun. And, 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 they, and then they lifted audio from the Star Wars movie, which by the way, you can do at home. Uh, they lifted audio from the Star Wars movie and put it in. Don't, don't get me wrong. If my buddy did that, I'd be like, that's really cool. But what about the potential of the movie? Yeah. That no, could be the no. movie. This, this, look, we were talking a little bit about, before about that that clip on Parks and Recreation. This, this is exactly what you described already. He said, okay, Boba Fett starts with Boba Fett climbing out of the Sarlacc pit. Okay. So some a fan went out and made a cute little fan thing, and it, it looks good, but it's a guy in a Boba Fett costume walking across some sand. But here's the thing. Tons of people have ideas like that and they don't actually follow through and do it. From a technical point of view, as a fan, I say, bravo, that's great. But as a Star Wars, as a higher than that, as a Star Wars fan, I'm not looking at that and going, what? No. David, are you going to the light side or the dark? <laughs> I, I, I'm about to go over to the light because this, this, this looks beautiful. And it shows, we're talking about people getting work done. This shows this kid, or who knows, it could be an older person, I don't know, get, gets yeah. work done. It's, it's all you have to do is just, just put it out there. It's George Chase Miller. your dreams. Yeah, chase your dreams. Just put it out there. <laughs> just Find something. Shoot something. Just do, do it. it. Make <laughs> your dreams come, come true. true. Well, let me, right. let me throw it. this out there. There's a, there's a friend of our show, uh, Kevin Rubio, uh, who's a friend of our show, um, made the ultimate Star Wars fan film and pretty much the original fan film that kicked off the craze of fan films. Troops. He made Troops. That movie's now how many years old? 12, 13, 14, 15 years old? Um, and he was doing stuff 15 years ago with Troops. Which, by the way, if you have not seen Troops, I'm sure you can find it on YouTube. Look it up. It is, I still think to this day, the best fan-made uh, uh, like fan film regarding Star Wars. It's just hilarious. It's really well done. And when you see the visual effects in it, remember, this is a guy who did not work for ILM at the time. Um, mm -hmm. if, with technology from 15 years ago, and it's, I think it blows this out of the water. Today it blows this out of I the water. I just think that what, it's, what it did is that because the Trank thing was so fresh and because Boba Fett, when they announced spinoff movies or anthology movies or Star Wars stories, whatever the hell they're called, um, when they announced those movies, the, he was the first one out there and everyone was wondering where it was going to take place. And even though this isn't official by any means, yeah. uh, it, it makes you, it, 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 it caused a response in fans to see this and say, yeah, I, I'd want to see this story. Even if the film itself looks fan film-ish, that's what you want to see. We're hoping, because some people you know, thought maybe they wouldn't even have, it wouldn't even take place during that time, that it took place, you know, like we were talking, like how he became Boba Fett. I don't want to see that. I don't care about that. I, I care about this. But anyway, um, that that's it. That's that's Star Wars stories. That was a big uh, a big chunk today. So we're going to get, now we get to the part of the show that we like to call What's the deal with canon? I mean, come on. Uh, the I mean, come on is not <laughs> part of it. It's not part of it. Come <laughs> on. Uh, now, what is the deal with canon? Canon, if you don't know it and it's your first time, canon is everything involved in the Star Wars universe that relates back to the timeline of Star Wars and ultimately goes back to the movies. This could be the comics, the games, uh, the, the, the novels, anything, the toys, anything that goes back into the world of Star Wars and into the movies. We talk about it here. Uh, David, what is up first in canon? We are talking about Star Wars Rebels Season 2. We finally have a premiere date. It's going to be October 14th. Uh, it, it's been a weird release schedule with Star Wars Rebels. John you know, loves it. 
Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I like it. I mean, for those of you who went to Celebration, you got to see it really early. Then they released it a little bit later, and now they're coming back October 14th, and it's okay. But anyway, we're going to start off with um, uh, the crew, the ghost, uh, meeting up with some, some old uh, clones. And there's going to be some, Dave Filoni's been talking about, there's going to be a little bit of a uh, struggle there because um, Kanan doesn't trust the old clone troopers because of order. And if right. you've been reading the, the comic book, right. you've been seeing, you could see why he doesn't trust them. So we're going to have, it looks like it's going to be, those, those clone troopers have gone kind of crazy if you yeah. watch the footage. So what do you think about that, Chris? I love it. And I love that they're, and again, being, this, is, this goes back to something that John and I have talked about many times on this show. And people ask, if I don't read the comics and I don't read the books, am I going to be lost? No, but you're going to be rewarded if you're a fan. And this is one of the reasons why. Because because like David just said with Kanan, you know why he was so – what happened to him and his master because of the clone troopers and because of Order 66. 66 yeah. But there's also something else in there. Um, in the, Are you reading Lando mm-hmm. right now? So did you see in this trailer when they brought out that head of that droid? Yeah. That's the head of the droid from that bounty hunter. Yeah. In that, and you see how his head is removed in the Lando comic. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And, and they, didn't even, they didn't pay reference to it. They just said, this is one of those droids. Yeah. That, and like, if you're reading the Lando comic, you know. So a, a gift. And those things are going to start happening more and more as you read the books, as you read the comics. It's happening in other like if novels. If you're reading the Vader one, I feel like a character in Rogue One might be from one of those issues. Oh, do you do you think Felicity Jones? Do I you think th- it is. Oh, interesting. I'd like to hear your your take on that in a second. But um, so Star Wars this this preview here, that's what I took out of it. And I took a, a lot of the trailer that we saw from at Celebration. It, it was like a very mini, but it means we're getting close. Now I know you hate the date of when it's coming out, but let's let's get past that for a second. <laughs> um, and we're getting to the fact that we're finally getting a date here. Um, you've seen this little teaser here. How are you feeling about it? I'm incredibly excited for the season of Rebels. I mean, I, th- I think, look, and everything that we've seen in the trailer so far from the new season of Rebels looks spectacular. And we're coming off not just a great season of Rebels, we're coming off a great finale. The, the end of, of Rebels season one was like the architecture of it was so perfect that it left you feeling satisfied with the end of the season, yet incredibly anxious to get started on season two. That's a difficult trick to pull off. Right. A lot of like a lot of great TV shows end a season with something that is great for leading you to next season and making you die to see the next episode, but doesn't give you any sense of satisfaction that this is a, a wrapping up of this season as well. Rebels pulled it off and they did it great. That being said, you cannot just get past this idiotic. <laughs> I tried, guys. I tried. Idiotic I tried. I tried. release schedule of theirs. <laughs> I don't it, understand it This is it either. absolutely yeah. ridiculous. I mean, he I brought it. it up last week, but it really bears me. I had a buddy. I finally talked into trying Rebels, and he didn't watch season yeah. one. I just got him to watch the opening two episodes or the opening mini movie of season two, and he's like, "All right, when's the next one on?" Uh, we don't know. Yeah, and then and then I was talking to him again just before last week's uh, episode of Jedi Council, and it's like he now it's, it's out of mind now. He doesn't even think about Rebels anymore. It's like idiots. But anyway, aside from that, I cannot wait for <laughs> season two to get started. I totally agree with the scheduling because I try and follow, and I'm like, wait, so we're getting two more, like a set of two on the 14th, so like another mini movie, which we already got. One and then do we have a break again until it's every week? Yes, like, that's exactly that's what I was where wondering I'm like. Too. I still don't understand where I'm watching it, and I'm a big fan, so it's like if I have trouble following, right. like you said, somebody who's episodes new year, to too. it, with someone who's new Which to it awesome. though, and it's like, yeah. and the other thing is they are going to be at New York Comic Con and they're showing the two episodes there, and I think it's like Comic Con falls like the seventh to the eleventh or something, so it's right before that. So at first I was like, "Well, are they showing the same stuff they're going to show on the fourteenth? Are we getting two other things? Right. Like, what's happening?" So scheduling is a little wonky, and I think they're losing some fans because they're going to get them all back as soon as it starts. Once it's well, I think they'll get fans back as soon as they start your doing your optimism DVD is your weakness. No like way, I'm telling you, you, you know, you, if they, they'll get most of them back, they will get most of them most back. Of but them they, back. there's no doubt they. This will come with a price tag. Their strategy on this will come with a bit, whether how big or how small, and I don't think it's going to be a big price tag. I don't. But there is going to be a price tag for this very unorthodox schedule, and I don't see any upside to it. I would rather not have long two episodes and just have half an hour a week. Like, why Why do they keep having to put them together in a longer episode? I'd rather them do. Just, I'd rather be, like, peppered every week. You also got to remember, I think that... And I, I don't know because I'm not Dave Filoni and Simon Kinberg, but I, I think that one of the things that is possible is because they went from what, 12 episodes or 13 episodes to 22 in a short amount of time. 
Like the last season was just a year ago. Mm-hmm. So they have to pump out now 22 episodes that they'll, they'll be continuously working on as, as it goes on. So I don't think they're going to make this mistake next year. At least I hope that they don't. But I think because the because it was so, it, it did so well at, with fans that they upped the order for it. It's a big demand to, to jump to. So, but David, you know, you, you see this and you, and you hear everything that's being said. How do you feel? I mean, for the season, I'm excited, but I agree with all of you. I, I, I had to, I write uh, reviews for Screen Rant and I reviewed Legend of Korra. I was very frustrated with that because Nickelodeon would change the schedule. I reviewed uh, Young Justice as well for a while and the schedule was always changed. It was always sporadic. So I was like, oh, we're going to be on this week and then you wouldn't see the show for a month. Yeah. There's nothing on the website. There's nothing in the, in the previews for the upcoming episodes. You just didn't know when it was coming. So this is frustrating. I think they will maybe lose some people because of this. But either way, I'm still watching. You it know, it's a, a testament to the show, though. Here's, here's a testament to the show. <clears throat> Would any of us be having any problem with this if it was a show we didn't give a crap no. about? No. no, no, and that's a right. testament to just how good yeah. this show. All right, is. what's next? I wonder too if it's taking time because of the fact, like you said, it got so much more excitement than maybe even they thought it would. Mm-hmm. That it's like we can't pump out all these stories yet because it's going to spoil a lot of stuff. Where it's like. We have to maybe point. put then, breaks then in. Then don't give us the, the hour long thing and wait also, till you launch it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think they, it's it's a long. It's, it's, a lo- it's, it's, a, it's, it's not as simple. As, it's, it's not as black and white as we're right, it's, it's, right. I'm sure there's a lot yeah. of shades of shades of gray. David, but, so, so we're kind of sticking with the same topic. We're going to stick with Star Wars Rebel season two. We're going to talk about Filoni uh, released a little. It looked like it came from the maybe behind the scenes in the Blu-ray uh, for season one that's coming out. And he says, I want to give you. We got four important things that he says. You will find out about Ezra and his parents. You will find out how Ahsoka and Rex affect the dynamic of the crew. You will find out uh, does Ahsoka know who Darth Vader is and who is this new top secret character that he uh, makes reference to. So those are the important things to uh, take out of that. Well, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and make a prediction and say top secret character is a Mara Jade type. Wait, what? the top secret character that Ahsoka references in that little trailer where she's like, go meet with my friend? No, no, no. She's talking. That's Rex. Oh, okay. That's talking about Rex there. But I, I think, I think the Mara Jade type character that Sarah Michelle Geller is going to voice. I think that's that's the character there. Now, the other thing I found pretty cool what Filoni said was he's like, you know, and then you know whether or not she's going to confront Vader, and if they're going to have a conversation, you might see that. I, I hope you see that. We're going to see it. It's yeah. The guy, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. so that's that to me. And I think that John, and you and I are on the same page here. Vader and Ahsoka go at it in the season finale, yep. and Ahsoka does not come out alive. Yep. Yeah, and I, like for somebody like me who absolutely hates that character, so crazy. This man. is a total redemption for that character. Uh, like that's how good Rebels is. It took this character that I really despise, this Ahsoka Tano waste of time, and suddenly now you put her in this new context in Rebels, and they've made her, they've changed her slightly, and suddenly now she's compelling, especially when you put her in this context when she has such a pivotal role to play. You're right. I think it does come down to her and Vader. I think she ultimately sacrifices herself for the good of the new uh, coming up rebellion mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff, and she plays a pivotal role. As far as who the secret character might be, I, I don't know. It was like some... Is that the dishwasher on the ship <laughs> standing in the back? I have no Who's idea that guy? what that's about. Right. I wouldn't mind. I also wouldn't mind if Kanan lost the beatnik poet goatee. I'd be kind of okay with that if he lost if he lost that a little bit. But um, but yeah, the, the secret character. I hope you're right. I hope you're right. I hope it is a Mara Jade type character. Um, which I wouldn't be surprised later on. We talked about this too. If later on we find out that the character's name is Mary Jade, like yep. Star Wars right. does that, gives us one name, right. switches it up right. later. I'd be totally down for that. David? I'm really excited to see, uh, find out more about Ezra's parents. Because when I first saw him, I thought he was just a typical bratty kid, kind of annoying. But you see him grow, especially the one episode where he goes into like an old temple. Remember, Kane has to wait outside for yeah. him. And oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's when Yoda, Yoda's first round of tests. Yeah, I, I, I love that. So I want to learn more about him, more about his family, because the more I see him, the more I like him. Kind of like you said, like Ahsoka started off a little bit annoying. Like he, he did the same thing for me, but I like him. Now. He may be a street rat, but he's our street rat. Right, uh, Aladdin. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, I'm just uh, super excited for the show. Obviously, I like the stuff that Dave says. I feel like, like you said, obviously we are going to get that fight because he wouldn't mention it and he wouldn't be like, I hope that we see it when he's the guy (laughs) who is in control of that happening. Um, And I do think, I agree with you, John, that I think she'll end up sacrificing herself to help save everybody else or thinking that, you know, she can go and talk to him and connect with him because they had that connection at one point. Um, So I'm excited because I think that obviously we got great fights and I think the stuff going to save Kanan the first season was like heart wrenching, but the stuff between her and Vader 
is yeah. going to be, especially if you watched Clone Wars, is going to be so heartbreaking. Right. Because when she does realize who it is and what he's done and what he's become, like, I, I'm going to say I might cry this season. Well, let's we'll bring up the other thing that he mentioned in the point there. He says, we will address the question. Does she know if he's Vader? Mm -hmm. Now, myself personally, and this is part of the reason why I appreciate, I think there's more to her now. The way she shocked awake, like that moment, to me, that communicated she realized who that was. And then the fact that she is keeping it to herself, mm -hmm. I think adds more depth and more dimension to this character. I will actually be a little disappointed if we find out that she doesn't know who he is yet. Although, on the, to play devil's advocate on the opposite side of that, that could be an interesting story you know, line for this season of Ahsoka trying to find out who is this new Dark Lord. But I think she knows. The, I agree with you. I hope she knows as well, too, and I think she does. But... Also remember that we haven't seen the last of Obi-Wan Kenobi, in the, and especially in this series. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, what did Obi-Wan tell Luke? That Vader murdered all the Jedi, and that Vader hunted down and killed Anakin as well, too. As far as Ahsoka knows, Vader killed Anakin. Because remember, when Sith Lords are, are supposed to, to kill, it's rumored that when they kill certain Jedi, they assume their life force as well, too, a part of it, part of that force. So maybe that's what she assumed, that that's the man who killed Anakin. So I feel Anakin's Presence, energy. Yeah. Right. But I happen to agree with you. I think that she felt it and knows. But I also wouldn't be surprised if she thinks that it's uh, Anakin. Well, even when Vader was coming, Ezra and Kanan both said that they felt the energy, you know, of Vader. But they didn't know who he was or why it was so powerful. So obviously there is a connection through the force that people recognize things or can sense certain things. But I don't know how clear it is. Like you're saying, it's maybe she has a moment of like, wait, why does this feel familiar right. or brings up a memory or an emotion? And then it's like when she comes into contact with him again, it's made more obvious to her that, oh, this is him. And right. you'd expect that his energy and force would have changed from the things he's True. done Dark from side. when she knew him. Yeah. And this this reminds me of something George Lucas said once about the prequels. When he was talking about the prequels, he goes, look, remember, in the original Star Wars films, when we see Obi-Wan and we see Vader, we see two old men. I mean, yeah. Vader is past his prime by the time we get into the original trilogy to the point that the Emperor's thinking, I think I might need a new recruit sort of thing. We think, I think because of that, we often forget how powerful Vader is. And it wasn't really until I was reading... Um, Lords of the Sith. Lords of the Sith that you really remember. Darth Vader is incredibly powerful mm -hmm. in the Force. He's he's constantly emerged in the Force. Yeah. And so when you were bringing up those great points about how Ezra and Kanan could feel that presence and it confuses, that's how powerful right. he was. Uh, okay, David, what's next? We are going to talk about a coloring book that has broke the web. Broke the web, coloring book. Two new characters <laughs> revealed. Uh, there's one guy named Sarko looks really cool. Uh, so what are we getting with these glimpses of these two new... I mean, does, does the coloring book do it for you, Christian? Is this, is this big news? Is this big? <laughs> it's not... You, you know, it, it's just one of the... I was talking about this with John <clears throat> as we were walking up here today, too. Um, sometimes these comics or... And excuse me, these coloring books or these, or these toys or whatever it is, they have a character that it's just like they're just selling a toy and that they're selling a color and that's all it is and that's very well what that might be mm -hmm. but there's also another version of it that we don't know yet this guy sarko could be the new darth maul or something someone you know and, and what i mean by that is a character that even though he was only in one movie stuck out people remembered him it could be that guy now i don't know who the hell he is i have no idea but tiffany you see this what do you think um, I think that it's something where obviously you take notice and say, okay, these are characters that play somewhat of a pivotal role, even if it's a quick moment in the movie that the creators of this coloring book decided, okay, we're going to put them in the coloring book because it's not, neither of them are, and I never have created a coloring book, but <laughs> I'm like, if I'm going to put something different in, I want to put something different in so that there's like a new design to color on. And I'm like, both of these, I mean, we already have droids in there and Sarko is maybe a little more detailed, but is like a mix between Vader and Kylo Ren to me yeah. with like lizard hands. Um, yeah. So it's like, it's not necessary to put them in just because they look so different, 
But if you put them in, it makes me think that. Do you like how much in depth I went into the yeah, lizard? Well, sure. yeah. Are those? Yeah. Is, that, is, that, is, that, is you have hairy hands or lizard hands? Well, I, mean, I think they're lizard yeah. hands. To when me. you have the hybrid, though, you mean look at PZ four CO there. Yeah. It looks like a hybrid between Grievous and C three PO. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, exactly. David, what do you think? I, I love him. I really like the way. I mean, Sarko is probably my favorite. He is very detailed looking. He looks interesting. He has a look. I mean, it looks like he'd be a bad guy. I'm guessing. I I, I want to know the visor. I guess that's the whole point of coloring books. You can. Envision whatever you want. I'd love that mm -hmm. visor to be see-through. Yeah, uh, it's true. Yeah. Kind of yeah. like the football players. Were. I'm frustrated with the lack of consistency in these pictures. In the one oh, picture, no. he's got no shoulder strap. In the other picture, he's got a shoulder strap. What are they doing here? <laughs> I think these pictures are the equivalent of if this coloring book was put out you know, in the early 1980s, these, these two pictures would be the equivalent of Hammerhead and the little demon creature right. in the cantina. Right. I I mean, it, look, could very well be that these are two major new players. But who knows? My, my gut feeling on it is these are two characters standing in the back of a cantina. Yeah, all right. Also, you go back to what Kathleen Kennedy said, and she's like, we're going to reveal stuff in new ways. It's not just always going to be on panels. True. And absolutely. So it's like, yeah, and you know, they've been doing that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, David, what's know. next? So November, December may be the big month where The Force Awakens actually comes out, but November is a big month for the Battlefront series, Star Wars Battlefront. Uh, the video game you've heard of, the book is getting a cover. The book is coming out on November 3rd, exactly two weeks before the highly anticipated game that I got to play at E3. It was awesome. It comes out on November 17th. So what do we think about the cover for Battlefront Twilight Company? Well, I've made no mistake that I'm. this is the book that I've been the least excited about. Um, now, that being said, so is Dark Disciple. I was not, and it's one of my favorite books so far right now. Um, but we're talking about the cover here. Mm -hmm. I love the cover. I think it could have served for a cover of the video game if they wanted to. And, it's, and that's probably what it was. It was probably yeah. a cover. One of the one of the, the B cover. It was probably <laughs> one of the proposed covers. And they decided to go with it because they loved it so much. And it was a back and forth. And they went with this. But John, you see this cover. What do you think? Well, the first thing that stands out to me is that the Mel's Diner owner that Obi-Wan talks with seems to be in there, at least oh, somebody yeah. from his race. They make cl they're cloners. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's the guy. That's the same race. And they, there. that race also has a big part in a new dawn. Oh yes, yeah. that's right. Yep. <clears throat> now, I am not big on the cover. I got no problem with the cover. To me, it feels more, you know, oddly enough and appropriately enough, it's for a video game. Mm -hmm. It feels like the cover to a video game more than it feels like the cover of a book to me. So, uh, no problem with the cover, but it's not jumping out at me either, David. Now, how does it, Chris, I have to ask you a question. How does this play canon wise? Yeah. So, you know, you're the expert in that. Does this, I mean, it's based off a video game. So, a video game is interactive. It depends on how you play the with game. Different endings. What, different endings. Well, yeah, different endings. So, well, the, this the is, game is, this not is, this is the well, game this is, is not other than. Canon. Yeah, well, the than. game is canon. Pl certain elements of the game are canon, like the planets yes. that you play on, too. Yes. But there's no thread or any story going on in the actual. Well, the game follows canon, but it is in and of itself. Yeah, because like you can play, you play, you play certain adventures and stuff too that right. are not canon. Now this, this a particular story is canon mm -hmm. because it's about the soldiers that, and I believe it happens in right before, it's right before empire is when this happens. I believe so. Um, I don't think it's between empire and Jedi. I think it's right before empire. So you're going to learn new characters and you're going to learn things. What it's, it's really going to serve. I almost thought what I hope it turns out to be because w from reading the stuff that I have is that it almost turns into like a band of brothers of star Wars, mm -hmm. which yeah. that to me, if done correctly, can be, be great. Interesting. Could yeah. be great. And, and that's what I, hope it is but tiff what do you think you don't like the cover yeah whatever i don't care about this <laughs> yeah. i feel like it's getting to the point and i i have talked about this a little bit before where i think i will get overloaded at some point and pick the things that i want to check out and the things that i don't i'm excitedly overwhelmed about all the toys i if i get overwhelmed about the books i'm like that one can go right which I'd, ones have you I'd read so way far, rather by the way, play the game. The books. Yeah, I know you read you read Lords uh not Lords of Sith, but you read Dark Reading Dis Lords. Okay, and Dark Disciple. Yeah. Okay. Uh Air. Okay. Right. Uh Dawn. Oh, okay. Those are the ones I've read. And yeah. Tarkin. And Tarkin. Oh, so most of them. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's uh, that's our thoughts on the picture. Okay. Next, uh, we talked, I guess, more Battlefront news, yes? Yeah. We're going to Battlefront. We're talking about the uh open beta. It's gonna happen it's for everybody. Who, well, you have PS4, Xbox One, or a PC. Um, and uh, so for all those uh, gamers out there, this is an exciting time. I love betas. Just got done playing the uh, Call of Duty 3 Black Ops uh, going on. So I mean, or sorry, Black Ops 3. Uh, betas are always a fun time, especially when all the major systems can get involved. Everybody can play them. It's game to test them out. Uh, makers can see what the quirks are. People can respond mm -hmm. to, hey, can you fix this, fix that? Maybe they can make some last minute changes. It's only a month out from the game's release, so we'll see. But uh, I played at D3. Uh, I can't wait for everybody else to get their hands on it. Christian, are you excited to play some Battlefield? Uh, I am. Battlefront? I, Battlefront, Battlefield. Absolutely. I think you, you explain. <laughs> 
explain you explained the, the what the beta release is perfectly. I don't really I mean for, so it's just a more or less bring Battlefront because right. it's the first Star Wars game to play. We talked about it not being canon. I don't care. I just want to go to whether it's it, John and I sitting in in there going, "All right, we're rebels together. Let's go get some people or fighting again. He's a rebel, I'm on the Empire, whatever." That's what I'm looking forward to do. It's going to be a lot of fun. Is anyone not excited about Battlefront? I wasn't. I know you are now, though. Yeah, I am now. Right. See, I, I wasn't for a while because to me, when I would see it, I'd say, okay, it looks like any other first-person shooter with Star Wars skins on it. But then once they started releasing stuff of you get into the cockpit of an X-Wing and all that kind of stuff, it's like, all right, now this is kind of feel <laughs> like Star <laughs> Wars. We've got like a 70-inch TV uh, out in the, the foyer of our offices here, and I can see Christian and I are going to be spending a lot of hours yeah. sitting on that couch playing yeah. this game. My wife, out. where are you? Working. <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, everybody else, everyone else excited about it? Yeah, I was gonna, I'm excited yeah. about it. My, my one question, which I don't know if I haven't done that much like research on the reviews of people playing it. Uh, with multiplayer, I'm like, how do those moments happen where you are in the cockpit of a TIE fighter? Like, who gets, if you're playing multiplayer mode, how do you decide who gets to do that? Because right. if you're playing with people that you're not friends with or sitting on the couch next to, and they're like, I'm never getting out of this. And you're like, but I want to fly. Right. In. Right. Like, uh, I don't know how that dynamic is going to work. Or do you have to level up to a certain point? I don't know. Right. Uh, okay. Now I know that the, the next story here, a lot of big news in the world of toys. It happened yesterday too, right? I, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of out of place here. I feel like everybody in the office was talking about everybody had their phones out looking at what they're going to buy. I mean, everybody's excited. Tomorrow is uh, the big, the big day or midnight tonight some stores are open midnight i think uh some stores open eight in the morning some stores are already put out, oh, the put out. True story true story we're doing casting last night we've been casting yeah. all week for for new shows that we're doing here over collider video and you know dennis and wendy and i are going through audition after audition after audition with people <laughs> and you know then we got some time to ourselves and we're having the serious conversations then we're looking at cast lineups like if we did this if we did this we did this and like wendy like uh, wendy your thoughts and wendy's like staring at her computer that i thought she's taking notes but like wendy's like do i get the Kylo Ren lightsaber. Or do I go for the B eighty M? Do I? Oh, look how cute this one thing is! Like the, so, yes. Even our crew has been it's completely been, well, obsessed. Well, yeah, Tiffany has yeah. been super obsessed, obsessed yeah. by it. And I want to know, like, so out of this stuff, because I know we were going to talk a little bit. Of, we were going to talk about the the stormtrooper, but that was before all this other stuff came yeah. out. Uh, you've been going through the list. What are some of the key things that you saw that you think are cool that you're that you're stressed about that you want to? Well, get? here's the thing. There is a checklist of all of the toys that are coming out on Friday. Some of them are exclusives, mostly just the Funko Pop ones. Everything else, I think, is going to be just they're going to keep making it. So it's not that these are limited things, but it's just getting your hands on them first and how long it will be till more stuff comes out. Obviously, I think everyone's freaking out about both versions of BB-8 because you've got the Sphero version, which is a little bit bigger it's not, I think it's remote controlled, but it's a little bit more realistic to the movies. The BBA with remote control is a little bit smaller, but also looks pretty freaking epic. Um, you've got buildable lightsabers, which those ones, I think if you go to Disneyland, they have the ones where they're extendable and you can choose what kind of hilt you want and what color you want. But then they obviously have the Force, Force FX ones, which I want the Kylo Ren lightsaber. That's one of the main things that I want. And then all of the figures, you know, there's, there's one specifically that I want. I don't know who the character is but it's the speeder with the special edition stormtrooper mm -hmm. and That's i think that star wars episode 7 news yeah that one That's with awesome. the red stripes um i want that one i have no idea who he is she is but i want it right. <laughs> yeah, um so i think any of that any of the figures and then disney is having exclusive ones that are a little bit bigger metal cast figures that look just beautiful um, so I feel like if you run to a Target, if you go to a Disney store, look wherever there's a shop local to you and go in and just buy something that makes you excited because there's going to be a lot of stuff coming out and the stuff that comes out on Friday, there's going to be more yeah. of it. So don't feel like you're never going to get your hands on it. All right. That's a lot of the Canon stuff today. Um, and by the way, this is where and we we have been anticipating this. This is the time where all the Canon stuff is going to really start. The, the, the journey to the Force Awakens begins tomorrow. Coming out is Aftermath, the book by Chuck Wending. We will have a review on that pretty soon. Um, that's going to be coming out. We just talked about Battlefront. Um, after what's the, let's see the um, there's the other Uprising is coming out. The the, the mobile, mobile game. game. They, there's the, the Shadows of the Empire comic book. All those are coming out. So we're going to talk about all that stuff coming out here. I think that we can even get John back into the comics that way. I'll just let him look at my phone. <laughs> um, so yeah, all that stuff. And I'd like to thank Star Wars Seven News by the way. 
way, not only for posting, they, they really have been so supportive of this show, but they have great articles. They round up all the news, but they do put their own special articles. There was, they've put a whole thing on Obi-Wan that they wrote up themselves. Check that site out if you haven't checked it out. Now, it's time to hear from you guys. This is the part of the show where you guys write in every week and you tweet in, hashtag Collider Jedi Council. You submit, we choose. David, who's up first? Going with uh, Isaac Chavez at Isaac Chavez 20 on Twitter. Do you think Sabin Wren has any connection to the Knights of Wren, possibly children of her and Ezra? Hashtag Letter Jedi Council. Uh, it's supposed to be Sabine. Yes, yeah, Sabine. Okay. They, so, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. It's not you. Yeah, it's okay. No. Tiffany, let me let. Well, I know that this goes back into your theory here as far as uh, with Rogue One also, because I had assumed maybe that Felicity Jones was playing Sabine, but you don't think that's the case. Do you think Sabine Wren has any connection to a Knights of Wren and has children with Ezra? I don't. I Obviously, the last name makes you think, oh, that would be kind of on the nose. Um, with Ren and Ren. I don't, I, I'm trying to stop doing the, this person's related to this person and they have this baby. The galaxy is so big. Let's Thank bring you. in new characters. Right. So could there be a connection there? Sure. Does there need to be? No, because right. I think that there's enough stuff we've been getting that, like you yeah. said, is like icing on the cake for if you're reading the comics and you're doing this. But I don't need it in every single character. Yeah, I think there's no chance. Uh, I think it's just coincidental. Yeah. And say Sabine Wren is completely different. She got I think a better it's two on the nose. No, she got a better chance of being related to someone in the Boba Fett uh, clan than, than she does because she's a Mandalorian. So they're, they're, they're going to play off that. I think the Knights of Wren are a lot older than people think they are. But David, what do you think? Yeah, it's like you guys all agree. It's, it's a big universe out there. I mean, we're we're located on one planet, so you know we have people we might be connected with. Can you imagine there was a whole universe yeah. mm -hmm. of highly populated, you know, uh, places to be? So no, I don't. I think, I don't John, think so. two things to keep in mind. First of all. Ezra is a Jedi Padawan. He would use protection. Smart kid. <laughs> secondly, uh, <laughs> you okay, too? <laughs> secondly, <laughs> secondly, um, how many people were running around the Star Wars galaxy named Antilles? Like, remember that? Um, like, there was there's Wedge Antilles. You have Captain, Captain Antilles, Antilles, who was on the like so. Just because the name is there doesn't necessarily mean which is the same. Are they thing. not related? Those two? I don't believe they're related. If they did, it was a, it was a it was a vague expanded yeah. universe kind of thing. Yeah. Um, it's it's one of those things where it's like in real life, I have met other people with the last name Griffin. Really? Um, yeah, I've not ever met anybody with the last name Harloff. I, okay. I'll admit that right now. Nice. I have met a few Smiths, <laughs> um, and so I yeah I, I think we're reading a little bit too into it, but. You never know. You yeah. never might want to pull some, but right. I agree with Tiffany. It's a little too on the nose right. for that. All right, David, what's next? We're going to uh, Emily Van Natter. Hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, do you think on Twitter, do you think Star Wars uh, 7 will be rated PG or PG-13? And is it possible to make a PG Star Wars movie now? Christian? I mean, is it possible? Sure. I just don't think that it's going to happen. Um, now, we don't know. Remember how long this deal is going to be with Disney and, and Lucasfilm. It's a, it's, it's a long time. So a, a PG movie that could be a Star Wars movie is an animated film down the line. They might, they might very well do something like that um, that tells a story. But right now, with the episodes, no chance right now for episode seven, eight, or nine being PG. Mm -hmm. it's, it's already, even the stuff that we've seen, it's too dark. It's too, I mean, J.J. Abrams doing a PG movie, I don't see it. I could be wrong. But, John, any chance that PG movie Star Wars happens soon? We have dark, scary monsters. We have villages being burned yeah. that we you know heard in the J.J. thing. We have people in fights to the death. I, I don't see how they can make this PG. Now, can you do a PG Star Wars film? Yeah, I, absolutely. At some point, you could do a Star Wars anthology movie that is a much more family-friendly, and Star Wars is family-friendly anyway, but I'm, you could do a Star Wars anthology movie set on like the fourth moon of Endor or something like that that is much more you know family-based. Um, you could do that and yeah. make it really good and really great, but these episode movies... No, nah, it's gonna right. be PG thirteen. PG thirteen is the safe one. I mean, the biggest blockbusters out there are PG thirteen. You know, Avengers, Avatar, yeah. Titanic. It's not like it's like a rated R where it's like, oh, it's gonna hurt the box right. office. I mean, this is gonna make tons of money. You go to PG thirteen movies, you see little kids. You know, I don't know. You know, depends on the parent what they want to take their kids to see. But you know, you see little kids there all the time, so it'll be fine. I think you know, PG is what we get from Rebels, and if that were live action, it would probably be PG thirteen. You're right. Yeah. So I think. Yes, there's a chance that we get a Star Wars story down the line that's PG, 
but I think that they'll probably stick with PG-13. Yeah. All right, David, what's All next? Right, we're going now to Rob Cameron at Rob at Cameron R. Come on. Uh, no one seems to be talking about the fact that we will soon be getting a new John Williams Star Wars score. Your thoughts, Christian? I think that it is a great point that he brings up because I remember when Phantom Menace came out and everybody, and one of the main things they did that was a mistake with that was they released the score so early and people were listening to the score before and it was titled like Qui-Gon's Death and all this stuff and it was just, it gave away so much. But it's crazy that there's so much stuff because they've kept everything so secretive and you don't know what anything is about. No one is really talking about John Williams except in the last little Instagram teaser, the little piece of music that they put in there, it was brilliant. It was it it was it was old yet new. I loved everything I heard about it. But this is but Rob's comment, yeah, it gets me excited just thinking about it. We're getting a John Williams yeah. brand new score. Tiffany, why haven't we heard more about it? I mean, I think it's what is there really to say other than it's John Williams doing the score for the new Star Wars movies? Obviously, I think that that lends itself to we're going to get nods to what we know and character themes and that kind of stuff. Obviously, I get excited because I'm like, oh, my God, that means that the Hollywood Bowl, he's, they're going to have new stuff from the right. new movies. Oh, my God, it's going to be so awesome next summer. Um, so I'm super excited about it. But I think it's also you're not going to release a song before the movie comes out. It's not. It's not like I'm well, they did that, and that's what they dumb did. Dumb that I'm going to Fifty Shades of Grey, but where it's like the weekend <laughs> that song came out, and it was like everyone was really into it. But it's not necessarily something where it's like they're going to release a new Star Wars theme song on the radio. Uh, well, <laughs> like, but they released it on the internet. That's what I'm wondering is yeah. because they did re they did release it for prequels. But David, what do you think? Uh, I'm just excited, John. You're talking about how the prequels got the fight choreography right. So they also got yeah. the music right too. Mm -hmm. I, I love that song "Across the Stars." You know, it's it's a really love song with you know um, the pad. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever. But yeah, the music is great. It's beautiful. Great. Yeah. I remember went to go see Star Wars in concert at the Hollywood Bowl here. Everybody had their lightsabers. I was there. there. Yeah. 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 I was there. It was awesome. That was awesome. I, I think it. John Williams came out towards the end. And just did at least the one I was at, and just did like one song, one or two songs, and everybody just lost it. Right. I mean, because he's he's the maestro, right. he's the man. I mean, he's done so many iconic movies, yeah. and so I'm I'm excited to see. I him. think he will play some uh, at least a track or two this year at the Hollywood Bowl. Well, and I think yeah. that people, it's not that people aren't noticing the music because obviously at Comic Con it wasn't John Williams conducting, but it was let's have the score right. played there, give everyone lightsabers, have this really awesome moment. So. I don't think that it's being ignored, but it's like it's not. We're right. not ready to get it yet. And yeah, the soundtrack may come out before the movie's released. I hope not. Though. Here's the thing, though. I remember at Comic Con, <laughs> I got a text message from a rep at Disney to let me know, hey, just so you know, this is happening after the panel. There's going to be a Star Wars thing. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my gosh! And I start getting all the crew together. Like, blah, blah, blah. And then I heard it wasn't. But John Williams isn't conducting it. Lost interest. Yeah. Let's remember too. John Williams hasn't. I don't think he's conducted an original and composed an original movie score since War Horse in 2011. So it's it's been a little while. He might have done s another feature film after that, but I don't think that he did. I was not happy with the John Williams score in in the prequels, mm -hmm. except for my God, Duel, Duel of the Fates. Fates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Duel, I I can still listen to that every day and get pumped up and get like <laughs> that. That is just. And that's almost on the level of the Imperial March for me. Duel of the Fates mm -hmm. is so brilliantly done. And so the fact that we haven't really heard much from John Williams, and not only Star Wars in concert, I go every year to John Williams in concert at the Hollywood Bowl. And he does all of his different scores. I don't think he's doing one this year. Oh, he's not? Unfortunately, oh, really? I don't think he's doing one this year, no. Oh, wow. Um, but it's, how can you not be excited? Because it's not like he's still been doing three films a year. Mm -hmm. This is not just the first John Williams in a while. John Williams Star Wars were beginning a while. This is the first John Williams, greatest yeah. composer of all time, doing in a while. So I'm super stoked. All right, let's take a couple get more. Get it in the trailer. We're going to get so much in the trailer. <laughs> right, we're going to go now to, <clears throat> excuse me, Brian William at Doc in the Blue Box. Uh, Brian asked, what are your thoughts on what the prophecy about the Chosen One actually meant? Was it Anakin or was it Luke? I'm very curious to hear John's thoughts on this because I know we've kind of discussed this here and there off camera, but what do you think that it means? Because I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I, I'm one of those guys that I do... I take it literally as presented. I, really, I do think Anakin was the Chosen One. Ultimately... You know, watching the Phantom edit, I saw that scene again today where that horrible scene where Obi-Wan is, you were the chosen one, Anakin. You know, it's, he was. and But ultimately, he is the one who brings balance to the Force. Yeah. He's the one who destroys the Emperor and brings balance back to the Force. Um, so, yeah, I, I do believe that he's the one they were talking about. I do as well because of that scene. Again, that scene with Obi-Wan, you were said to destroy the Sith 
not join them? Well, he did both. Because yeah. cause when, he, when, when he killed the Emperor, he also got so damaged that he ultimately killed the Sith version of himself. Yeah. So that's why it might be possible that the Sith don't come back. And I said the Ren are the new Sith or whatever it might be. So I happen to agree, and I think that Vader is the chosen one, too. I agree, because I think that this is a character that changed the Star Wars universe so much that it makes the most sense saying that this is the chosen one, because... Sometimes when that happens and someone's chosen, they have, as Spidey says, with great power comes mm-hmm. great responsibility. And so it's like, which way did he st- decide to go? Do we believe that no matter which way he went, it was still going to be the same fate right. that it led to? Um, so, yeah, I definitely think it was still Anakin and Vader they were talking about. Dude. Yeah, I agree. I don't think there's, there's not a timeline, you know, to saving the world as long as the guy's still alive. As long as he's got breath, he has a chance. I mean, what if... <clears throat> what if Frodo tell people on Alderaan that David I know tell people on Alderaan I know that. I know they're gone but I mean he, they're he, all dead they're all dead <laughs> oh uh, yeah he, he came through okay uh, <laughs> next one <laughs> we're going to go speaking of uh, the dark side we're going to Darth Crunnel uh, we're going to go uh, do you think there is a chance we can see Cad Bane in Rogue One Christian uh, do I think that there's a chance we can see Cad Bane in Rogue One yes I do actually I think that this that you have a, the one shot of a Clone Wars character coming back. It is going to be Cad Bane. Here's why. I was watching that unboxing yesterday from StarWars.com, which was doing it. Then they right. had the host on there. They did a top five bounty hunters list, right? Cad Bane was number one. Two was Boba Fett. And intriguing, and yeah, and so I was like, they are. That also means that is, and and granted, it was just one of the hosts of the show who does like rebels interviews and stuff too. But this is someone who talks a lot with Pablo Hidalgo and Lee. Lynch. Also, let's be honest, that person did not make the list. Maybe had some say had in some it, say but in also it. there were right. right but right. I the, <laughs> the the Cad Cad Bane was a character that jumped off the screen in the Clone Wars, menacing. The voice, everything about it, and and a great actor could performance capture it. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if it was Ben Mendelsohn, um, but I don't think it is. But Ben Mendelsohn as Cad Bane would be incredible. Uh, Tiffany, Cad Bane, any chance in Rogue One? Um, I thought the same thing when I heard that bounty hunter list because it's not just that the character was on the list. Because mm-hmm. then I'm like, oh, that's cool. Let's make a nod, like. We do it on DC All Access. We make a list of top things, and it's not saying that, like, number five is, like, whoa, maybe something to look at, even necessarily not one. But you're like, if that character is number one, it's like, you should highlight this character right. because you're going to want to know who this is. And I think if if I had my way, Ben Mendelsohn playing that character be would be awesome. Yeah. John? <laughs> is it possible? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it likely? No. but But not... I would say like a 40% chance. So I think it's unlikely, but I do think it's possible. I can't help but every time I see Cad Bane, I think of Clint Eastwood and the good and the bad and the so ugly. Right. Like that's, that's all I yeah. see when I see him. I mean, I think he's perfect. He's straight off the page of a movie, of a Sergio Leone movie. I mean, he has yeah. that Western look. I mean, it looks cool, but that shot of Rogue One, you know, when you see it, you know, the shot, I don't know, the picture like this, like, like a blue face there. Yeah. You know, cat. Yeah. I mean, they, they could do it. Of course, it's, it's an alien. You know, they're yeah. in space, but it just it doesn't seem voice. like it would almost fit. Oh, but he's so good. he's perfect. Yeah. All right, last one. <clears throat> oh, okay, we are going to the Geeks Addict asks odds that Max Va- Max von Cedo, right? I was yeah. Cedo could possibly be Kenobi's Force Ghost. Um, Thanks for I, answering that. Thanks for the awesome show. The odds to me are a zero percent. Zero percent. Yeah. Anybody else to have any? I, I think you're underestimating. No, it's zero. <laughs> <laughs> Force zero. ghost age. Yeah, I, and <laughs> no. I and, until recently, I, I was kind of up in the air um, who I thought Von Cedar was going to play. I will have a little bit more on that next week on who I think he's going to play. Right. Um, okay, that's it. But before we do that, John, we've been doing the question. Uh, uh, Mark's yes. not here for the question, so we'll let our new council what? give their percentages. John, po- let them know what the Uh-oh. question is and then pose your Uh-oh. question, please. All right. So what we've been doing the last couple of weeks is, you know, we have these characters. We have uh, Kylo Ren and we have Rey. And, you know, the theory out there that they are actually siblings. So the question that we are asking every week, because new information comes in every single week, so we change our perspectives a little bit. We're going to call an over-under, or no, we call percentage percentage wise, wise, yeah. Percentage chance that Ray and Kylo Ren, by the time we see this movie, turn out to be siblings. So David, let's start with you. Percentage chance from zero to 100 that Kylo Ren and Ray are actually siblings. Oh, wow. 
That's a tough one. I'm going to go from our discussion earlier. I'm going to go like 30%. Wait, can we hear your guys' percentages? Sure. What was your sure. last week? I think mine last week was 70. Oh, you want to... oh you're changing everything. Oh. You can change. You yeah, can. Oh, you can. New okay. Yeah. Oh. Every okay. Week. Yeah. New news. I had the biggest drop. You had a huge okay. drop. Had you had went all the way down to 20? I was at 90. I was at 95% and I dropped to 20. Yeah. What well, made you drop? I, I, I stuff we can't say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But where are you at this week? I'm How, still around between twenty and twenty five. Okay. But, yeah. I'm actually going up even more. I'm going up to eighty. You're going up to eighty. Yeah, honestly, oddly enough, all this casting stuff about a new female lead in episode eight actually kind of reinforces it to okay. me a little bit. Right. But let's see what I say next week. Tiff? Tiffany, what about you? Um I'm gonna go with oh gosh. 65%. 65%. 65%. All right. Those are the percentages. We'll see <laughs> how they hold out by the time the movie comes out. Really fun, stacked episode of Jedi Council. I'd like to thank the council today. The Grand Moff himself, Grand Moff Griffin, thank you so much for holding down the fort today. What? Uh, where can the people find you? You can find me on Twitter at GriffinDE. You can find my writings on ScreenRant.com. You can find my Mark Ellis-like face <laughs> on Think Hero Pro. And by the way, you did a much better job than Mark Ellis. <laughs> a much better job than Mark Aww. Ellis. Poor Mark. Poor Mark. Miss you, Mark. <laughs> yeah. I want to see him miss you. Uh, <laughs> and join me, it's the Smith Lord. I see you often, Smith Lord. Where can they see you? Uh, you guys can find me on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, at Tiffany's Tweets. Uh, you can see me every Thursday on new episodes of Movie Threesome on Fandango Movie Clips YouTube channel, Schmoes No on Thursdays, and I host a Star Wars podcast called Far, Far Away on Geek Nation. And DC All Access is brand new starting again September 7th, and you can check that out on the DC YouTube page. You have like nothing going on. Uh, and Obi, you know. John Kenobi, John Campia, where can the good people find you? Uh, I will be opening the new Star Wars toys that uh, Ray <laughs> and Ann buy for me tonight as they go and get in line. And uh, of course, you can find me Monday through Friday on Movie Talk, of course, on Heroes on Tuesdays, uh, Mailbag on the weekends, and of course, Jedi Council here as well. And we don't forget, guys, we are starting, we are launching Collider Video into television here pretty soon. We've got six new shows coming at you covering Arrow, The Flash, Supergirl, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., The Blacklist, and Empire, and we're looking to add a whole bunch more pretty soon, so keep your eyes open to that. And you can follow me just on Facebook or on Twitter at John Cambia. And for me, you can find me at Christian Harloff on both Instagram and Twitter. And just in in case you didn't know, the Ultimate Schmodown is still going on, and Dennis and John Schnepp are still in the tournament. They're going into the second round. They'll be playing in about two weeks, so if you haven't watched that, make sure you do. And make sure you get involved in the Star Wars conversation here. Every like you guys just like we just did a whole bunch of them. Hashtag Collider Jedi Council. We go through these during the week. We put them out there. You guys ask great questions. Thank you so so, so very much, and we'll see you next week on Jedi Council. May the Force be with you. <laughs>